So far in our discussion on fetal circulation, we saw that the way that blood moves inside the developing fetus is different than the way the blood moves inside the adult circulatory system. Now, the next question is, what exactly happens to the circulatory system of that fetus as soon as the fetus is born when that fetus takes their first breath? And more specifically, how exactly does the circulatory system of that fetus transition into the circulatory system of the fully functional adult individual? So before we examine those questions, however, let's recall some important facts about the way that blood moves inside that developing fetus before the fetus is actually born. So recall that inside the lungs and more specifically inside the alveoli of the lungs, we have a fluid. And what that does is it creates a high resistance and a high pressure inside the lungs. And a similar thing exists in the liver. So the lungs and the liver are not functional within that fetus. And so inside the lungs, we have a high resistance and a high pressure. And the same thing is true inside the liver. Now, if the blood were to actually move through the liver and through the lungs, that will greatly decrease the flow rate of that blood inside the fetal circulatory system. And to prevent that from happening and to create a quick and efficient circulatory system of that fetus, what the fetus does is it redirects blood away from those two organs via special type of passageways, special types of shunts known as as the ductus arteriosus, the ductus venosus, and the foramen ovale. So remember, it's inside the placenta where gas exchange and nutrient exchange takes place. And as soon, the, and as, as, soon as that takes place, the oxygenated and nutrient-filled blood will travel away from the placenta and towards this general direction via the umbilical vein. And eventually, when it approaches the liver, there will be a shunt that will exist between the umbilical vein and the inferior vena cava. And this shunt is shown right here. It's known as the ductus venosus. And so it's the ductus venosus that allows the blood to quickly and efficiently bypass the liver and enter the inferior vena cava. Eventually, the inferior vena cava connects with the umbilical vein and connects with the superior vena cava, the partially oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mixes and that goes into the right atrium of the heart. Now, <clears throat> Within the right atrium of the heart, we have another type of shunt that exists. This is known as the foramen ovale. Now, if we zoom in on the wall separating the right atrium and the left atrium, this is what we get. So the pink section is the wall of the right atrium. The purple section is the wall of that left atrium. And notice on the wall of the right atrium, we have a hole as well as a hole on the wall of the left atrium. And what this creates is a flap of wall that can open in the same way that a door can open. So this only opens one way. It only opens this way. Now, this portion is known as the septum secundum. This portion is known as the septum primum. And this entire valve structure, door-like structure that can open one way and close the other way is known as the foramen ovale. Now, if the pressure is, is higher on the right atrium than on the left atrium, as it is in the case of that fetus, the pressure will create a force that will push on the septum primum, will push on this door, and will open the door, allow the movement of blood from the right atrium to the left atrium. So remember, inside the fetus, the reason we have a higher pressure in the right side of the heart in the right atrium than the left side of the heart the left atrium is because of the lungs the lungs have a high resistance create a high pressure to flow and that causes a high pressure to exist in the pulmonary trunk as well as the right ventricle and the right atrium and so that's exactly why the blood will be shunted away from the lungs will bypass the lungs and go directly from the right atrium into the left atrium then into the left ventricle and then into the order. 
Now, of course, some amount of that blood will still leak into the, uh, into the right ventricle from the right atrium. And when this happens, the blood goes into the pulmonary trunk. Now, when the blood is inside the pulmonary trunk, it also has a choice in the fetal circulatory system because we have this tiny passageway, this tiny shunt that connects the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, and this is known as the ductus arteriosus. And because once again, we have a high pressure inside the lungs and a low pressure inside the order, what happens is that oxygenated blood has a choice to bypass the lungs and go directly into the systemic circulation into the order via this duct known as the ductus arteriosus. So these three ducts basically allow the fetus to create a very quick and efficient way to move the blood within all the organs and tissues of the body. And if it wasn't for the these three ducts, the liver and the lungs, would basically create a very slow blood flow and that oxygenated blood would not be able to get to the brain and the other important organs and tissues of that developing fetus. So this is what takes place within the fetal uh, within that fetal circulatory system. Now, what happens as soon as that individual, as soon as that fetus is born, what happens during the first breath? Well, remember, the alveoli of the lungs are completely filled with the fluid, but as soon as the first breath takes place, all that air that rushes into the alveoli of that lung displaces and removes pushes all that fluid out of the alveoli and this expands the alveoli and by expanding the alveoli that decreases the resistance and decreases the pressure inside the alveoli so as soon as the first breath is taken what happens is we have a decrease in resistance and so a decrease in pressure uh, which takes place within our lungs and that eventually also takes place within our liver. So the liver begins to function following birth and so the resistance as a result of that decreases. Now, because we decrease the resistance and the pressure in the lungs, what happens is now the blood from the right atrium is more likely to move to, in, into the right ventricle and into the pulmonary trunk and then into the lungs where the pressure is now, is now low. So air fills the alveoli of the lungs, expanding them. This decreases the resistance and the pressure in the lungs. And as a result, the blood rushes from the right side of the heart and into the lungs. Now, as the blood moves along the, this side of the heart more easily, the pressure inside the right atrium and right ventricle decreases, and that decreases the pressure on the right side of the heart. Now, as we have more blood being pumped into the lungs, more blood is coming out of the lungs and moving into the left side of the heart. And so eventually what happens is the pressure on the left side of the heart increases. So eventually the pressure on the right side will decrease, the pressure on the left side will increase, and the pressure on the left side will, uh, will become greater than the pressure on the right side of the heart. And when that takes place, that's when the foramen or valley closes. So remember, the septum prima, this wall, will only open this way when the pressure inside the right atrium is higher than the pressure inside the left atrium. But as soon as the first breath is taken, the pressure inside the right atrium drops, the pressure inside the left atrium increases, and so we have a reversal of the pressure differential and now because the pressure on the left side of the atrium is greater it will create a force that will point in this direction and that will close shut this foramen or valley and eventually what happens is this basically forms 
uh, a closure and this also forms a closure and so this is basically shut closed. So following birth there is a reversal of the pressure differential that is the pressure in the left atrium is greater becomes greater than the pressure in the right atrium and this causes the septum primum to push against the septum secundum which closes the foramen ovale and this usually takes place within minutes following birth now this ultimately causes all that blood to be redirected from the right atrium into the right ventricle and eventually into the pulmonary section and then into the lungs and so we have the closure of that wall the closure of that one-way door that exists within that developing fetus and this is what we call the foramen ovale or the closure of the foramen ovale so within minutes of taking the first breath the foramen or valley is closed. Now let's move on to the ductus venosus. So what happens to the ductus venosus? Well, once that fetus is born, what the physicians do is they essentially clamp down the umbilical cord and that causes the clamping of the umbilical vein. So at this particular location, we clamp down the umbilical vein and that creates a high resistance within this section. And so what happens is blood essentially stops flowing within this section of our blood vessel and eventually this entire umbilical vein, this entire blood vessel along with the ductus venosus eventually diminishes in size and the flow of blood decreases eventually it completely stops functioning, it closes and this usually takes place within days of the clamping process. So following birth the ductus venosus also constricts and eventually diminishes in size to a non-functional structure now what about the ductus arteri <clears throat> what about the ductus arteriosus remember the ductus arteriosus connects the pulmonary trunk to our aorta so what happens as soon as we take the first breath? Well, when we take the first breath, we have more blood flowing into the lungs and the lungs decrease in pressure. At the same time, we have more blood flowing into the order, so the order increases in pressure. And now we have a high pressure in the order, a low pressure in that pulmonary trunk, and so what happens is blood stops flowing from the trunk and to the order. So eventually the ductus arteriosus will also constrict and will also diminish in size until it stops functioning. Now, to be more specific, what happens is as soon as the pressure inside the lungs increases and as soon as the oxygen is carried into the lungs, the lungs begin producing a special type of peptide, a special type of protein known as bradykinin. And what bradykinin does is it causes the constrictions of blood vessels when there is a high uh, amount of oxygen. So the bradykinin essentially travels into the ductus arteriosus and because now we have a high oxygen content within that ductus arteriosus, the bradykinin basically causes the constriction of that ductus arteriosus. And so within hours, the ductus arteriosus will essentially constrict to a point where very little blood will actually flow between the pulmonary trunk and our aorta. So once again, following the expansion of lungs, they release a protein called bradykinin. As oxygenated blood travels through the ductus arteriosus, that protein mixes with the oxygen, with the high oxygen content, and it causes the constriction of the ductus arteriosus. So as the pressure in the lungs falls below the systemic pressure, below the pressure inside our aorta, less blood flows via this constricted ductus arteriosus and it eventually ceases to exist. 
So we see that within minutes, the foramen ovale closes as a result of the reversal in pressure between the right atrium and the left atrium. Then within hours, the ductus arteriosus constricts and so eventually the blood ceases to flow from the pulmonary trunk into the order and finally within days, as a result of that clamping process, the resistance inside the umbilical vein increases that causes less blood to flow inside the umbilical vein and inside the ductus venosus and this, uh, and this eventually becomes non-functional and ceases to function and ceases to exist. Now, another important change that takes place is the thickening of the left ventricle compared to the right ventricle. So, before that fetus is actually born, the, th uh, the size of the wall of the right ventricle is greater than the size of the wall of the left ventricle. And that's because the right ventricle has to pump blood against a higher pressure to the lungs. Now, what happens after birth is we have a reversal of pressure and so the pressure in the lungs drops and so what eventually happens is that left ventricle will become thicker than the right ventricle and this is what we see in the adult, in the adult circulatory system. So, these are the these are the some these are important changes that take place within the circulatory system of the adult individual as soon as that fetus is actually born.